perhaps the strangest we both shared together was what happened to us up in Area 51 with our lady friend, uh, Ivy West. <clears throat> so I thought what I would do is I would <clears throat> I would introduce the story from my viewpoint before it happened and then turn it over to you, uh, you know, at the appropriate point. I think it was back in 89. <clears throat> uh, I think it was 89, wasn't it, in December of 89 that this uh, experience happened to us? Well, it was actually... Um... We had we had gone to the International UFO Congress. That's and right. It was actually and it was one of its last years, which was it it was in Mesquite, and it yeah. was the the first time that Pat and Joe had uh, extended an invitation for to come by for for you to come by. That's and, right. And I believe that they held those in November back then, and from what I understand and what I remember. And um, I believe it was 1994, actually. Was it really? I believe it was. Yeah, it's like <laughs> it was like 22 years ago. I mean, when you get way back uh, in, into the 1990s and you know early yeah. 90s, it's hard to remember exactly when. It becomes a blur when you get to be our age. But um, well, yeah, yeah, that's for, that's for damn sure. <laughs> but um, I'm quite quite certain it was. Uh, you know, in November of 1994, because it was after they had closed the um, um, that mountain range where uh, you know, oh um, yeah, 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 where they were taking that? people. Yeah, you know? yeah, the, yeah. The Air Force, I guess, came in and closed off that last little piece that people could go if you were stout hardy enough. You could go up in the mountains and with binoculars, and you could look down onto the base. Yeah, because otherwise we'd have been going away. up there. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, yeah, but I guess the government closed that down, so now you can't see it at all. Yeah. Except if you fly over it, you can't do that either. But uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of uh, pictures from uh, from uh, from the what do you call it, the uh, Sky Lab and all that kind of stuff. Um, looking down onto uh, Area 51. So if you just go on the web, go on the web to Area 51, uh, an image, hit image, and then Area 51. There's a lot of pictures of that base now. It's pretty well known now. But at that time, it was a very spooky. It still is spooky, but it was very spooky because no one, very few people knew where it was and had ever heard about it. So, <clears throat> but I was told about it quite a few years before, and I knew Pat and Joe, and uh, we had talked about on the phone, you know, Pat and Joe and myself had talked about the possibility of me coming up to visit one day, and so you're right, so we were, you and I were at a, a UFO conference over in Mesquite, Nevada, <clears throat> and on Sunday morning we were driving back and we decided I asked both of you, you and Ivy, if you had ever been to Area 51, and neither one of you, and I hadn't either. So we called them, and they said, yep, come on up as our guest and come up and stay with us. So we did. We turned around and went up to Area 51, the three of us. But before that, <clears throat> I want to lay the groundwork. About a year and a half before that, I was, a good, uh, I was the best man at my friend's wedding. Uh, and he lived up in uh, Palmdale, and I was in Los Angeles. It's about 40 miles north of Los Angeles. And so I went up there on the Saturday that we that he was getting married, and I was going to be the best man, as I said. <coughs> and his uh, his his fiance and her mother and girlfriends had to go out to the market. <coughs> And so uh, when they came back, there was a an old beat-up car uh, with an old man in it following them. And when they parked the car, he pulled them behind them. And, of course, uh, my friend and I were wondering, who is this guy following them? <laughs> and so they came in, and she said, that this, this guy told me, he met me in the market and said, I know you're getting married, and the best man at your wedding is uh, at your home right now, and I need to talk to him. <clears throat> so um, uh, I said to him, well, I, that's me. I'm the best man, so talk to me. And he said, um, well, I've been told 
to tell you that in a year and a half from now, you're going to be um, way out in the desert and you're going to be uh, you're going to be driving a car, and there's going to be a woman in the front seat, and there'll be a man in the back seat, and you're going to have uh, a, a, an incredible experience with some um, UFOs. They want to show <clears throat> themselves to you, and the experience, he said to me, the experience will be for you, but they want two witnesses. So they will see to it that there's a woman in the front seat and a man in the back as a witness to it. And that, but that won't happen for a year and a half from now. <clears throat> and so he went on to say, because I said to him, well, you know, my friend I'm, I'm here with right now, he and I usually go out on weekends. We go way out into the desert of, of uh, Palmdale, Lancaster. And this was, you know, this was back in the mid early 90s. And we go out, I told him, we go out and look for UFOs at night. <clears throat> and he said, no, no, this is going to be way out in the desert. You're going to be way out in the desert. And you're going to be, uh, and it's not going to be in California. It's going to be east of here. And, uh, but they'll tell, they'll, they'll see to it that you are where you're supposed to be. And when they, when they show up. And so a year and a half later, you and I and Ivy are driving back. And there's the woman in the front seat and the guy in the back seat. And so we called Joe and Pat, and they said, yep, come on up and stay with us. So we turned around and went up to Area 51, which is actually, it's called Rachel, a little little town called Rachel. And I do mean little. <clears throat> and we stayed with uh, Joe and Pat. We had dinner with them at the uh, restaurant, the bar and grill. And then they gave us... Um, they gave us a, a room. Uh, they have uh, mobile homes, and they rent out the rooms overnight because it's out in the middle of nowhere. So if you're out there, you need a room. At least you can stop at the little alien, and they got rooms. And so the three of us took a room. Incidentally, uh, you, as you will recall, the, the number of the room we took was 51, which is, I think, uh, hilarious now I look back on it. <clears throat> And so we were talking that night, the first night, about uh, we were at, at the table having dinner, a late dinner. And, and so we asked Joe and Pat, well, where do we go to see the UFOs? Well, Joe said, you don't have to go anywhere. They saw you coming. So just all you need to do is just go out and sit in the lot. And they'll, they'll show up if they want, and if they don't, they don't. And, uh, and so Pat said, well, if you're really interested to go where the tourists go, <clears throat> go back out on the highway and go south toward Las Vegas, go back toward Las Vegas, 19 miles, and check it on your speedometer, because right at the 19-mile mark, you will see a big mailbox on your right and a big parking area. That's where everybody parks at the at the big white mailbox. Uh, and so that's where all the tourists go, because you're going to see something, you know, if you're going to see anything, that's most likely where you'll see it is at the white mailbox. So I'm driving, you, you're in the back seat, Ivy's in the front seat, just like we, I was told. And uh, we drive out onto the highway, I don't know, maybe 11, 11.30, something like that. And I take a left instead of a right going south, I go north. And you didn't, you didn't catch it that I'm going the wrong way, and Ivy didn't catch it. <laughs> And so I'm driving north like I know what I'm doing, and then we're looking for the 19-mile marker, and we come up on it. But uh, then, just as we come up on it, Ivy then says, wait a minute, uh, Pat said to go south. We're going north. And so I said, all right, let's turn around, go back, go to bed. Tomorrow night we'll stay over, and we'll, tomorrow night we'll do it right. Okay, so we so we stop. Now this time, now we're... We're 19 miles north of the little alien, out in the middle of nowhere. And what we didn't realize is that it was totally and absolutely totally overcast. And so we saw uh, at where I stopped, there was a wide dirt road going off into the desert. And, and both you and Ivy uh, insisted, let's drive out in the desert a little bit. Drive out there. I was afraid to go out in the desert with a regular car, although the road was well kept 
and it was a dirt road, but I just didn't feel safe doing that. But the two of you insisted, so I figured, all right, we'll drive out a little bit. So we drove out, I don't know, a couple of blocks or more, and all of a sudden I got spoofed. I felt something was wrong, and I legitimately felt I had done something wrong. And I remember Ivy saying, well, there were no signs saying, keep out. This is not government property. Uh, we haven't broken any laws, so let's just stop. Let's just stop for a minute. And I said, no, I don't feel like stopping. There's something wrong here, and I want to get out of here. And, and then both you and Ivy insisted that we stop at least for a moment. So we did. We stopped. I got out, and I don't, you know, and if and anyone listening, if you've ever been on a desert when it's totally overcast, at midnight, that's what dark is. <laughs> you can't see anything, period. And so we got out, we shut the lights off in the car, the three of us are out. And uh, just a few seconds after we were out, uh, uh, there was an opening in the clouds. And any light at all, in total darkness, any light, you see immediately. So when this opening just north of us in the clouds opened up a little bit, two UFO uh, round saucer-shaped things, I'm remembering is about the size of a full moon in the sky, not little lights, full moon size. And behind them, five more came in. Now we have seven uh, full moon size glowing bluish white glow and the glow was uh was reflecting off of the heavy cloud layer above them and when i saw that it truly frightened me i don't mind admitting it, i was absolutely horrified and both uh you and and ivy were dancing around like you saw santa claus for the first time it was wonderful it was beautiful i didn't think so well there I was, was no scared. sound there was, there, there was was absolutely no sound. no sound. You could drop a pin and hear it. That's what was spooky too. That was absolutely spooky. And now, you know, go on and tell us about the, you know, the rest of it. Well, I mean, we're we're standing there watching these things, and they're 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 just floating very slowly away from us, but you know, back towards where we had come from, and they would float like, um, you know, all together. And then they would get far enough away from us, and then they would zip back in an instant and stop on a dime, like right in front of us, us again, and then just start floating again really slowly away. And so th that was kind of uh, strange because then that let us know that w that they knew that we were there. Mm -hmm. yeah. And at that point, you had said, that's enough. I, you know, we're getting the hell out of here. And, and Ivy and I – were like we were just really i mean it was it was a real treat to see these things i mean i had had some some sightings when i was j just a kid like many years before and yeah. uh, and so for me it was bringing back oh you know the the magic of having this having seen these things as a kid and then seeing them again it was just like wow this is amazing but you said well wait a minute we're in the middle of nowhere we're we're in the middle of a desert. They could do anything to us, and no one would ever know. We don't know who or what these things are. Well, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> and so you you said, well, you guys can stay here. I'm leaving. So you know, we had no choice but to jump in the car. And um, and you weren't you weren't really um unafraid at all. I mean, you were you were really afraid. And so I was frightened. I was truly frightened. So, you know, you actually tore out of there. We were going yeah. pretty fast, and these things all of a sudden are following us right above us. And so you decided, hey, I'm turning the, the lights off, you know, and yeah. maybe they won't follow us or something like that. But then, you know, you basically mowed down a couple of small cacti in the middle, of, you know, and we're sliding around and, you know, Ivy and I are screaming at you to turn the lights back on because, you know, we don't want to, you know, I mean, yeah, I get wrecked. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't have to kill us. What if you killed us? You know, we just, we don't want to be out in the middle of the desert flipped over in, in a crashed vehicle. So you flip the lights back on and, and, you know, um, uh, we convinced you to stop, you know, because uh, Ivy and I, we both rolled down our windows and stuck our heads out and we're looking up at these things and we're saying, yeah, they're following us and stuff. But then they did some 
really amazing maneuvers. And we, you know, Jordan, Jordan, stop, stop, stop. You, you got to see this. And so basically, um, I don't know why you did it, but we convinced you to stop and we get out and they, they just, um, they put on a little bit of a show for us. And I don't understand really to this day why we didn't have a camera with us, but maybe they knew that. I don't know, but they floated you know, together where they all were like touching each other and then they burst out into like a, like a circle and they burst out into sort of like a, they, and then they did like a star formation for us or something. And, um, they were, I, I guess they were showing off, you know, um, people, this is really, uh, one of the once in a lifetime things really amazing. I mean, they didn't, they didn't come down any lower because you know, that would have really, that would have really but freaked Will, us you out. you guys were already frightened already you know and uh and i remember yeah, I ivy was was screaming and saying look what they're doing look what they're doing and you were too yeah and, and so it was <laughs> you know it was exciting to see that because they knew we were there and they were you know like i was saying they were, they had to have been showing off but if they had come down lower and if they were going to make like looks like they were going to land or something <clears throat> I would have flipped out and wanted to get out of there too, but yeah. he didn't. So, but we jump back in the car, we tear out back towards the the highway, and then after we got back on the main highway, um, they basically disappeared up in the clouds, and that was the end of it, with, or so we thought. So yeah, and so on the way back, I mean, uh, and I remember distinctly when when we hit the highway. For some reason, I was no longer afraid. It, it, uh, the fear left me uh, once I hit the highway, but I was still, I didn't realize that I was shaking. I was nervous and shaking. And, uh, and so we stopped the car out in the highway and the three of us, and I remember the emotions were blowing through all three of us. What in the world did we just see and experience? Uh, and I'm shaking and it was, I remember all the different emotions. It was incredibly gorgeous. It was frightening. It was beautiful. It was this, it was that. And uh, on the, all the way home, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to keep the car on the road because my hands are shaking. And, we're, and the idea was we'd go back and maybe go back out the next night or whatever. So we went back to Area 51. We went back to uh, to uh, Little Alien. And we went in, and where we were staying uh, in the mobile home we were staying in, when you walk into the entrance, the, you walk directly into the bathroom, and on either side of the bathroom were room were ber- bedrooms, and on the left side was uh, two beds, and on the right side was one bed, and I was not about to sleep by myself, so I told Ivy, I said, why don't you and I take the the, 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 the left room, and Paul can have the right room, so you were in the room by yourself, um, and we laid there, I remember, for a half hour or so. Uh, talking about what did we experience tonight? Was this human or was this not human? And I think we all totally agree what we saw tonight and experienced was nothing of this world, nothing. And uh, so I, well, we finally fell asleep. Why don't you tell the rest of it? Well, you know, it was a late Sunday night, as I remember, because we had after the next, you know, in the following morning, we were asking. Um, Pat and Joe and other people, you know, what could this have been? And the people who, you know, test fly stuff and everything, they, they don't work on a Sunday night like that. So, I mean, it would make sense that, it, you know, if it's not people who are, um, pe- if it's not people who are, you know, uh, pilots, then who or what could it be? So, that that was kind of spooky, understanding that it was a late Sunday night, and and the you know the mile markers um, go in both directions. So it turned out that we found this. I don't know if it was like a 29 mile marker. They said it was something at, like or, that. Is 19 or 29, something like that. Yeah, but we went and we we had actually found it, but it was over in an area called Railroad Valley, or Railroad yeah, Junction, Railroad Junction, yeah, something like that. And so yeah. we we found it. But we couldn't find the mailbox, so we kept turning around and looking, and then we just like, wait a minute, you know, this isn't this isn't right. We got to we had to have gone in the wrong direction, and right where we stopped, 
there was that road. And we said, well, we've come this far. Let's just go down this road and see what happens. Yeah. And that's how the whole thing unfolded. It was just incredible. Yeah. And, um, you know, and then we get back and, and we talked about it for a little while and we realized, wow, man, well, this is an unbelievable, you know, experience to see these things. I would have given my, my, my right arm to have, to have a camera with me that night. Oh, boy. And, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Because normally when you see like, um, UFOs and you see pictures of UFOs that people have taken, you know, they're off on the horizon. But these yep. things, they, they came right above our heads, and that was one of the, uh, the scariest sp- parts of it as well. Because when these things, are, it, it makes you feel a bit vulnerable when you've got these things that are just right above you, and you're in the middle of nowhere. That's right, so, boy. So, yeah, um, and, and 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 I don't know if they were radiating that fear as they were working with our emotions, because I was absolutely frozen with fear. Well, I wasn't. I was like, "Hey, bring it on! Let's." This is yeah, like, I know. I know. You and Ivy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and maybe it was foolish of me to think that way, but I just, for some reason, I just, I just loved it. And but then all of a sudden, you know, later for me, the story's not over. I mean, I had a part two to this, and, uh, yeah, and that's actually, what we wanted to talk about tonight. Yeah, and uh, this was something that. Uh, you know, I can't, you know, for me personally, I I can only tell you what happened. I mean, I'm not going to ask people, I'm not going to ask people to believe it. I don't care if you believe it. This is, this is just what happened after I got into that room. And this is something I don't want to be known for. I write books on spiritual subjects and stuff. I'm not a UFO guy, kind of. I had some, I've seen some stuff, you know, and, and this is like, you know, no, no. You write a lot of books. You you are an author and have written many books on spirituality, on human intelligence and wisdom and knowledge. And you have got an incredible bookstore called The Book Tree Bookstore in San Diego. But you're 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 a very prolific author. Uh, but like you said, this is what happened. You know, yeah. So. So um, you know, I went to sleep and it was probably about. Oh, sometime about 3.30 in the morning or something. And I heard somebody moving around in the hallway bathroom outside my door. And so only to find out the next morning that neither of you had gotten up to use the bathroom that night, but I'm hearing somebody in the bathroom. I wake up, and I'm just kind of laying there in bed, and all of a sudden there's these three balls of light that show up in my room. One of them's bigger than the other two, and this thing's just floating around near the end of the bed with other two small ones. I'm just looking at this thing, and I'm looking at this bigger one. It's just like all of a sudden the room seems to, like, start spinning, like, really slowly. And and it's like I'm not getting dizzy or anything, but just the room has this spinning sensation. So all of a sudden it just gets faster and faster and faster where the room just seems to be spinning like crazy. And all of a sudden, that that, that um, uh, glowing ball of light and the three balls of light are not there anymore. This room is just, you know, cooking in like a circle really fast. And it gets going really fast, and all of a sudden, it just stops. And I'm looking around, what the heck happened? And I had something happened where my, my mind became, like, really lucid. I felt like I just, there was just this tremendous, like, um, knowledge or awareness clar- yeah this clarity of mind it's just like whoa you know it is it's just like a a shift in my consciousness for some reason and i'm just like and then, so i lay back in bed and i lay back on a pillow just like whoa i'm just experiencing this this lucid form of consciousness and i'm looking up at the ceiling and there's up at the on the ceiling they have these old square like uh lights the, yeah. You know, the, the two light bulbs behind, and, and it was in the middle of the the ceiling. And I'm looking up at that, and all of a sudden, this 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 it's like gray, and it's like a you know it's something that has light bulbs behind it. I'm looking up at this thing, and all of a sudden, it just morphs into this face of this standard looking gray alien looking down at me. And it's not like, and it's just a face. It's not like this creature is standing above the bed, you know, and menacing. Or it's just like this 
face of, you know, and I'd read in books later that this is some kind of a masking thing that, that had been reported from others or something. But looking at this face, and it's looking down at me, and all of a sudden, looking into the eyes of this thing, everything in my life that I'd ever felt, experienced, done, it just goes through. It's just like um, going through my mind. And it's like flipping through the pages of the Encyclopedia Britannica at like uh, 10,000 miles an hour, but being completely lucid of everything as it goes by through your mind. And this thing's looking down at me, and it's just kind of sucking all that information out. It's just trying to figure out who I was or whatever. But I'm looking up at it, and I'm trying to like basically communicate with it and just say, you know, um, who are you? You know, why... Why are you why are you here? And it was just before that basic upload of information had happened. I'm just looking up at it, asking and trying to communicate with it and say something, but and get it to respond to me, but it didn't have no interest in um communicating with me whatsoever. It was there to just do what it was gonna do and, and that was it. And it just kinda reminded me of, you know, when we um, tag an animal out in the wild, you know, if it's a wolf or a dog, or we don't try to bark like a dog and try to communicate with it. And it was treating me the same way, like an inferior. I'm just there, and it's going to do what it's going to do to me the way that we do to maybe an, an animal that we've taken in and are testing or something. I mean, that's all, that's the way I felt afterwards. And um, so then after that happened, then that was it. It's gone. and and you know, and just, and then that whole feeling of 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 higher consciousness or just real clarity in my mind, maybe that was set up within me so that this that process could occur. I don't know. It's just like it was just really, really the most bizarre thing that I've ever experienced in my life with some, you know, not even a full blown creature of anything, just some face up on the wall kind of deal. Yeah. But you know that's that's what happened. So I wake up the next morning, and I'm and I'm thinking, you know, what the? How do I t- ask these guys what's going on? And so you were asleep. I go up and, and I'm sitting at the counter. I'm getting some breakfast. Ivy comes trudging in, and I sit and I said to Ivy, I said Ivy, how'd you sleep last night? And she said, Paul, you're not going to believe this. I woke up in the middle of the night. There was a ball of light in my room, and I was paralyzed. I couldn't move. And I woke up this morning with blood coming out of my ear on my pillow. And she had had um, uh, experiences in her past where she she had claimed to have been had an abduction experience, and and she uh, says that she's got some scoop marks on one of her legs to show that that had happened at a previous point in her life. So she. She felt that maybe something had happened, but I just said, I, I just couldn't believe it because a ball of you know balls of light in my room and then a ball of light in her room and she can't move and and just then I told her what had happened to me and we just flipped out and we were just saying this is just something happened absolutely something happened in these rooms so let's wait and see when Jordan gets up and let's ask him what 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 he experienced last night. So then you came in and we said, hey, Jordan, you know, are you okay? I mean, uh, uh, you know, how'd you sleep last night? And basically, he said, oh, I slept like a baby. You know, everything was good with me. So I don't know what that means, but I don't know, maybe you do, but they might have spared you or something, or or maybe they wanted to, who knows? I don't know. It's just... The, just well, I think, I think whoever they were, they were smart enough to know I've got a bad heart and bad lungs and I'm not well... <laughs> And so, and I've, you know, I've said before, I don't want to be frightened in my bedroom. Don't, don't scare me. Don't frighten me and don't take me anywhere. I don't want to go anywhere and I don't want to wake up and have a heart attack seeing something I can't deal with. So maybe they knew that. That's why they let me sleep. So, you know, we asked uh, Pat and Joe the next day if they've ever had stuff like that happen around there before. And, And it was mentioned by Joe that there was one time where, there was one of those gray aliens walking around out in their driveway in the middle of the night. That's right. Yeah, he and, said he he heard the dog barking and and he looked out the window and he said he saw this little creature walking around in the driveway. Yeah, I remember him saying that. 
So, so I didn't talk about this for, I don't know, probably about three, four years after it happened because <clears throat> for me it felt like almost like a mental rape. I mean, it made me feel like, uh, you know, it made me understand like what a woman feels like after she's been violated and, you know, physically. I mean, this was a, a mental type of like a mental type of rape. Basically, I, no one asked my permission, and it was, you know, everything that is, is stored within your mind is taken from you. Everything you've ever thought, felt, experienced, done in your entire life is just reached right in, and yeah, here, I'll take that. You know, it's just like, it's a real violation, you know, and it's it's not moral, it's not ethical, it's not uh, it's not right. And, well, but I, yeah, but on the other hand, you know, I, I had the, I've had things like that happen to me, too. What scares me is the mere fact that even during the event, uh, you know, you have no control. Yeah. Period. Zero. They are in control. They are in control of your emotions, your body. They're in control of everything. You're in control of nothing. Period. So it's like a little cat being picked up by, <laughs> by a grown man. Yeah. The, 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 the little animal has no control over anything. Period. So you're, you're at the mercy. If there is any, you're at the mercy of the of these uh, entities, but they never have hurt me, you, or Ivy. No one has ever been harmed or hurt. That's true. And uh, and um, so I didn't enjoy it though. Yeah, never, nonetheless, <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't like a picnic in the park for me. It was just like you know, I, you know, and I wasn't afraid earlier in the evening when we saw these things come out, and you know we're you know, out in the desert. But when, when you're face to face with some kind of creepy thing that you don't know what it is and it's uh, probing your mind, it's like, okay, that uh, that's where I draw the line. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, and uh, and I appreciate that that feeling because it is frightening. But I really felt my feeling when I first saw them is that my my gut told me immediately, this is not of this world. It is not of your world, period. And therefore, my my feeling was, this is something I am not able to deal with. This is not of my world. I don't understand its power. I don't know where it has come from. But it's frightening. It's it's far more powerful than your than you can. You know, it's like a child. I mean, I, I've been thought it's like a it's like a little five year old being put into a huge cage. With uh, gorillas and lions, uh, you know, and you know you have no power to do anything, and it's frightening. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the way I felt. I felt uh, totally fear. But uh, but then again, I have to say, they never harmed us at all. Yeah. They didn't harm us at all. So. Uh, well, you know, there was one more piece to the puzzle the next uh, the next day when we left. When you know they told us, you know, basically we found the we found the black mailbox, and what happened there at the on our way out of town on our way out of Dodge, <laughs> basically there was just one more event that happened, which let us know that the, yeah there was, there is some strange things going on at this particular time, out at Area 51. So yeah. Um, you know, we got to the black mailbox. And we said, "Oh, okay, yeah, we're here. Okay, let's just get out, and you know, we'll at least experience the black mailbox. Look around, say goodbye on our way out of town, and at least we can say we saw, we found the black mailbox." So we get out, and we, you know, we're looking around and all this stuff. And you remember that when the sky oh, yeah. came? Why don't you tell what happened there? No, no, you tell it. You you were there. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> yeah. You know, we we get out and we're. We're just walking around. We're not really expecting anything to happen. And uh, all of a sudden, the, the sky from all over the place in, in different directions, all these jets start crisscrossing the sky, some really low, some really high. And, uh, you know, we're just wondering what kind of an exercise is this? This is the it, – it, it's pretty cool, all these jets flying around, but there's just like tons of them. And then over on the edge of the valley, you're like really low – is this big black like uh, object that is kind of going low under the radar kind of thing, and it's escorted by two fighter jets, but there's this big gray cigar-shaped object which is just going low, and up in the sky above are all these jets crisscrossing the sky like crazy. 
and then they, they, this thing gets escorted out of uh, the area, and then all of it, all of it, then the sky just disappears. Uh, I mean, they just disappear. The sky gets clear, and uh, it's all over and done with. And um, yeah. What, what, yeah, and those jets were coming from everywhere, from all over, crisscrossing and zipping past us and zipping around, and uh, all the time we're looking at the jets doing their thing, and all of them, and a lot of them. Uh, like you said, this one black object was uh, was sailing across low with two fighter jets uh, escorting it. And uh, once, they, once they were out of sight, once they were gone, all of a sudden, zip, no more jets. Everything's quiet. It just made me wonder if there was, like, you know, technology that keeps an eye on Area 51 and they were, you know, escorting something out of there that they didn't want radar or satellites to pick up or something. I don't that's know. That's what I think. Yeah, that's what I think. They were they were filling the, the air. They were filling the, the sky with uh, with uh, heat, you know, from all the jets flying through. All of them uh, probably could uh, cloak the getaway of this of this uh, of this uh thing we saw, but obviously the military knew it, they were in on it, they were escorting it out, and they were protecting it by, by uh, you know, sending so many jets all around it and over and around it to uh, to blind maybe the uh, yeah. radar or, or, you know, like you said, satellites, maybe Russian satellites, but with that kind of uh, uh, activity, with all of those jets, there's a lot of heat in the sky. So uh, maybe that's what the, what they were doing was trying to uh, you know camouflage it so it yeah, gets but then, out. But then the very last thing that happened, the, the, it all becomes really quiet. The sky's clear, and then the very last thing that happens though is this one last thing. Is <laughs> yeah, I remember. All, the, all all of a sudden there's this rumbling and and you can hear the, the like the ground moving and shaking and this thing like really loud uh, noise. You can see in miles in all directions. Of and this, course. And uh, this thing, all of a sudden, it sounds like a like a super loud jet comes right over the top of us, just you know, and just like it just blow your freaking socks off. This thing, yeah, it's yeah, so right loud. over us, right over us, low. And you couldn't, and there was nothing to be seen, zero, nothing. I mean, and this thing just uh, is the loudest jet I'd ever heard in my in my life. Yeah, it was and loud, it is, boy. And and you can see for miles. You're in the middle of a, like a flat desert area, so that just that just really mystified me because you couldn't see what whatever that was. Whatever the, it was was big and loud and fast. Came right over the top of our heads, and you could see nothing. So it was somehow or another really legitimately cloaked. You couldn't see it, but we heard it. Yeah. So, you know, you know, we just look at each other. Okay, we can go now. You know, let's get out yeah. of here. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we've seen all we need to see of Area 51. But all of that, uh, I end up thinking that uh, you can think what you want about Area 51, but there is no doubt in my mind that there is absolutely legitimate, du jour, and real otherworld uh, things going on out there. Of that, there is no doubt in my mind. Well, all you have to do is buy the uh, videos of Bob Lazar where he brought people out there and, and they became, uh, he apparently became a non person after that. But, yeah. uh, you know, we returned a, a few times after that and, and it was non eventful, you know, every time. I and mean, we never really had much happen at all yeah. on previous, on, on uh, subsequent. Uh, uh, Follow up. Yeah, we'd see things. Uh, uh, the, the last time I went out was with a big group Anthony Holder, myself, and, uh, and uh, all, all, I can't remember all the people. It was about a dozen people, and we were all there at the, at the restaurant. And uh, we decided to go out where I had told them about the, where we had that event. So we decided, let's drive back out there and see if we see something tonight. So we did. And we, we brought lawn chairs with us. And we pulled out lawn chairs and people sitting on the back of their trucks. And, and we're just sitting out there at night under the incredibly beautiful starry night, uh, waiting to see if we see something. And all of a sudden, we spot two stars. Uh, one's a little larger than the other, but they're, they're moving. But they look like stars, but they're moving together in tandem. And they... And they began moving uh, from the north going south, but very slow. 
but we caught them. We said, well, watch this. They're moving. <clears throat> and so as they began to move, uh, and they came right over the top of us, these two little stars, they stopped. And they sat there for a moment. And we're sitting there. We're all of us, about a dozen of us, watching them to see what they're going to do. And all of a sudden, the bigger one flipped on a light. That light was so bright, it lit up Nevada. I'm telling you, that whole wow. entire, it looked like the 12 <coughs> noon with the sun uh, directly overhead. That's how bright that light was. It was so bright, it lit up the entire desert. And extreme bright, blindingly bright. But it was only out for, I would think, a second, maybe two seconds, and it went off. And then the smaller one also did the same thing, but not quite as bright. And then that shut off after about a second or two. And then they start moving again and start going further south again. So I know that whoever they are, if that was us, that could have been ours, I don't know. But whoever they were, they've got a light. You have no idea in the world how bright that thing really is. And I was thinking to myself, what kind of power would it take to light something that bright from that far away, to light up uh, the whole place like 12 noon. What kind of power source would it take? And you know, what, what are you talking about in technology? My God, if that's if that was our technology, we've got some scary stuff that we haven't been told about. But well, I've seen it. Mm -hmm. And so, and then of course, you know, you had other experiences too uh, that we talked about the first time. But I just think it was important that we. That we, uh, because I, I don't know too many people who have ever had multiple people seeing the same uh, uh, same experience, and then yeah, in coming general, back and oh, having experiences in the room. Yeah. yeah, the way that Ivy and I both experienced this light, and I kept my mouth shut. I asked her. I just decided instead of just, you know, just uh, getting all excited and telling her all about it, I wanted to see what what had happened with her. Yeah. And I couldn't believe it when she said that, that there was a ball of light in her room. But she was paralyzed from it, and I wasn't. I, then again, when that whole room was spinning and that sort of sensation type thing, maybe I, maybe I, I, I was, um, paralyzed. I, I didn't feel that I was, but, uh, I wasn't moving at the time either. So who knows? But it's, uh, it's certainly one of the strangest things that, uh, well, it's the strangest thing I've experienced and one of the strangest things I've ever heard of anyone experiencing. So. Well, you know, she was telling me that her when she was paralyzed, uh, <laughs> I've heard this many times, and it happened to me twice in my life, uh, where I was, I felt I was in a dream, and I saw a UFO come down over the top of me. It was a, it was a bright star, and my mother... And I were on the, uh, in my dream, my mother and I were on a roof looking at the sky and I'm talking to her about how beautiful the sky is and the stars and we're talking. And all of a sudden I said, look at that one star. And I pointed it out to her. This is in my dream. And all of a sudden as I pointed to it, it came down zoom right over the top of me. Huge mm -hmm. big UFO. Yeah. And, and when it did, I could not I could not move. I could not move. I was frozen. I, it took all I could do to draw a breath to stay alive because it just paralyzed everything, but it allowed me to breathe. And I kept trying to say something to my mother, to, you know, if, if, if she was seeing it, but I couldn't get the word. I couldn't get the words out because I had no, I had no wind. I had no. No, mm -hmm. uh, no wind in my lungs. I couldn't even move. I couldn't. So I know, uh, as people have told me that they've had that, you know, that in their dreams or at night in sleep, they are. But I got the term that's used for that when you wake up and you're paralyzed in your sleep. Oh, yeah, but, there's uh, some uh, scientific uh, term for that that's rather yeah, there common. There is a huh? term for it. <clears throat> so I, I felt that either, twice but... in my life. But uh, <clears throat> and Ivy said that was exactly how she felt. Whatever it wow. was, was a little light over the top of her, and she was totally paralyzed and couldn't mm -hmm. move. Well, the light that you said you experienced with this really, really bright light of a <clears throat> craft when you had returned—that's um, that's pretty interesting because I was I was just reading an affidavit of somebody who had experienced had seen 
uh, a similar very, very bright light coming from a craft, but this was back in 1943. And this was before even, um, you know, <clears throat> the term flying saucer was coined. And, you know, supposedly the, the first flying saucers were seen in 1947 up in Washington by, uh, uh, I forget that guy's name, but, yeah, um, yeah. but, um, there are reports of UFOs and, and things like that that predate that, which is really interesting. And I was just reading, there's this, um, a book by Trevor James Constable called They Live in the Sky. And, you know, Trevor passed away about uh, about four months ago. I know. It was a truly a loss, of course. He, he was a brilliant, brilliant guy. And he was he wrote, look, we're his publisher. We did uh, Cosmic Pulse of Life and, and uh, a real classic of uh, UFOs. And then we did a, um, a tribute book for him, too, called... Uh, and he was able to see it just before he passed away. But um, we're getting another book ready of his, an older book, because actually his first one called They Live in the Sky. And there's an affidavit in there. I was just reading it before going on the show, and there's this, this people witnessed this bright light. And um, the fact that the, these people witnessed UFOs in 1943 that um, – were reported, but this was a, a pretty hairy experience. I, I'd like to read this this affidavit. Yeah, yeah, we got a couple of minutes. Yeah. Okay, this is an affidavit from in the county of Los Angeles, and it says here, as president of the Copper Mountain Mining Corporation of Arizona, I was on my way to ins inspect a mine in 1943 at a mountain location north of Prescott. The mine is almost inaccessible, and then. Um, um, it says, uh, close to runs of the river Agua Fria, and on a hot summer day around 5 p.m., I was leaving the camp for the mine with two other men. These were another prospector and a Mexican miner named Is Isadon Montoya. We were on horseback fording the river. All at once, Montoya, who was in the, the lead, started yelling, El Diablo, El Diablo. We looked up and overhead. A most terrific drama was unfolding that lasted only a few minutes. A military plane was in sight. So were two large, unidentified flying objects. They looked like balloons without baskets. They were luminous and bright as the sun. So uh, the UFOs stood still as if waiting for the plane to approach, then pounced towards it. At the same time, they projected a violent, luminous ray that could be compared with the large beam of a lighthouse. The air vibrated with a terrific explosion as the plane was struck and came down. We saw two pilots bailing out, but as their parachutes opened, another fiery beam was projected from the UFOs. The chutes took fire, and the two helpless men fell to the ground to be crushed to death. The two bodies were later found. Meanwhile, the frightened Montoya was praying and crossing himself and repeating El Diablo, and he said that he had seen the same, the same thing uh, many, many times before, senor. Then from the horizon, coming from the north at an unimaginable speed, we saw another UFO. It joined the two above us, and together they shot like lightning to the south. We turned back to notify the authorities and tell them what we had witnessed. Somehow they had already been alerted, and a truck and a jeep were on their way. We met them and guided them to where we had seen the wrecked plane fall. Parts were scattered all over the mountainside. Then there's a All this is a story that uh, is fascinating, and, uh, but it reminds me of Roswell and others just like it. So all of this is telling us that there's something going on, and it's not human. It's not from here.